self quarantining. And a quarantine order. Quarantined in their Held in quarantine. Quarantine. The quarantine in place. Or quarantine for the required 14 days. What's up, people? This is another episode of Quarantine Talks with me, JC. And today I got a veritable OG out here in these VC streets. VC meaning venture capital and OG literally meaning original gangster, but metaphorically representing the prowess with which he demonstrated in raising capital. Jeff Booty! Ha <laughs> ha! That's how you do an intro. Booty, I expect royalties if it's used anywhere else. <laughs> Jeff is the CEO and creator of JobSnap. He's a biz dev consultant and a master class aficionado where he demonstrates why he is arguably the plug to end all plugs. Today, we talk about on this show the intersection of ethnicity and gender in the VC community, his podcast, Seven Questions, working for Oprah and own TV, and how that was like one of the first jobs he's ever had in his 20s. And his close relationship with Gail King and the controversy surrounding the Kobe interview. Spoiler alert, y'all wrong for that shit. Snoop, I'm looking at you. We are about to get into this podcast, but first, Bills. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to another episode of Quarantine Talks. I am JC, and today I have with me Mr. Booty. Booty, 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 booty rocking everywhere, man. Jeff Booty. Uh, Hi. Hey, what's, what's going, going on, on JC? <laughs> You're in Atlanta. I am in Los Angeles. Yes. How you doing? Um, barring pollen, everything is wonderful. It's well. Um, yeah, pollen. Oof. Yeah, I, <laughs> I love nature, but I'm certainly not uh, unhappy about my decision to be in the desert <laughs> here in LA. <laughs> the desert is wonderful for times like this, man. I swear to you. Ooh, boy, I care. Anyway, uh, but so, yeah, I, I know who you are, but for everyone else, do you mind telling the people who you are, what you do, and uh, where you from? Man, that's going to take uh, a lifetime. But <laughs> who I am in a nutshell is I am a uh, currently living in L.A. I have a, a company called JobSnap that I'm pa- passionate about helping young adults uh, uh, have opportunities to jobs. Here locally, um, we just partnered with a company called Leaders Up, and this year our goal is to help people in Chicago, people in San Francisco Bay Area have more access to jobs. Uh, I think that's going to be interesting now with the current state of the world more than ever to mm-hmm. use technology mm-hmm. to uh, showcase young talent. Uh, I also have a master class called Connect Up that I launched in January where I teach people how to build relationships with people of influence and power that was recorded earlier this year and that's going to be launching nationwide next month which i'm excited about and then on the side i just help companies with various things just consulting just biz dev uh raising capital uh etc so mm-hmm. so you're from wait you're from new york i know we, i'm I know from we, new york yeah, yeah. <laughs> how, new york. how did you end up in la how did i end up in la oh man i ended up in la because my first job in new york i worked in media and that opportunity, I worked for someone who's uh, well known and having spent three years in media and magazines, L.A. had always been a dream as a kid because, you know, you grow up and it's New York, L.A. You mm-hmm. know, I was fortunate mm-hmm. that I happened to grow up in a big city. And then the only city I would hear about is really L.A. They would always say L.A. is, a, you know, right. where celebrities are as well, where, you know, it's bi- b- vibrant and you can be in media as well, uh, entertainment. And so after this opportunity working with someone really influential, I decided that I would take the risks uh, to just move to L.A. And I didn't know anyone. Probably knew, I, at the time, I had one former coworker, but I had no friends out here and just made a life for myself. So I think working in the media industry in New York allowed me to be more comfortable feeling like I could make it in L.A., because uh, New York is the media, <laughs> is the, the center of media, fashion, Pretty much. arts. Uh, <clears throat> L.A., you know, obviously it's a big city, but New York still runs a lot of um, uh, those big industries like media. Right. Uh, more media than entertainment, because L.A. is entertainment. But media, fashion, right. Wall Street, uh, you know, heavy hitters in New York. So right. I felt more confident coming from a big city to try L.A., because L.A. is still smaller. Uh, population-wise in New York. 
not the metro. New York has a bigger population. Yeah, well, it's dense. Okay, yeah. density. density. Dense, yeah, yes, I had to yes, think about yes, that for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, LA is definitely bigger by by land. Yeah, uh, it's spread out. Yeah. yeah, but New York has more people. Um, with that that influential person was that Oprah? Was this yes. from a different? Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that later. I just just wanted to slight flex um for you but yeah <laughs> um getting back to job snap though um what made you create job snap and um can we talk about the phases of startup you know like from inception to concept incubation going out to vcs like can we talk about the process of that yeah definitely so what made me start job snap uh i had had been in the tech community for a few years at that point and as someone of color i realized you know five years ago that there weren't many of us focused on issues for our communities in tech Mm -hmm. and i think i realized the hard way or the real way i guess quickly the reason is because to start a tech company it's really expensive and most people who who are in the game of technology um if you're solving a problem and you have access to money, you're solving a problem based on your own needs. Right. And so people, proximity, people solve problems based on what they know. Right. Uh, Very few are the Mother Teresa's, uh, the Dalai Lama's, the people who think outside themselves and are aware of other people's problems. Everyone, most people tend to focus and know, again, proximity to what they've struggled with. Um, because they walk in their own shoes. And right. if you have a majority of people who control the money who are white males, then the problems that are, the, the technologies that are going to come out of that are things they think need to be solved. And now in five years, things have changed so much with communities, women, women of all colors, men, uh, minority men uh, being back for their ideas because the people who controlled it and still majority do weren't really thinking about other issues in other communities uh, and potentially big money ideas. So long story short uh, is that I just wanted to start job shop because I realized that there was a market missing in helping young people of color be seen by employers mm-hmm. who may have had um, a rough start. So majority of the people we work with have been potentially formally incarcerated. They have, um, and these are, could be small misdemeanors, but in our communities, that's still a strike, right? Right. I call these petty crimes, which my my white friends, you know, can easily get out of with bail of right. a couple hundred dollars. Where if you're poor, you don't have that, so you're stuck right. in jail, or you know, you have that on your record mm-hmm. because you know, daddy's not a judge. So ultimately, I think uh, for me, what made me push was just seeing some success in tech. And realizing if I don't start something for my community and do it now while I'm still young, then I don't want to wait until I sell multiple companies and then decide, okay, now is the time to problem solve. Because that could be another 10 years right. and the problem's still there. So I just put all my effort <clears throat> and backing into really trying to problem solve for the community I knew was still hurting. Uh, and I knew, And I learned quickly that my white friends weren't thinking about this as a problem. Uh, because they just never, they didn't have it at, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't their problem. <laughs> so, Tribe and proximity I was like, this is a problem. Dictates is everything. A problem. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you, my business partner, I told him at the time, I said, look, you know, your dad's a producer. You grew up in Beverly Hills. You, uh, he had a production company. My dad's an engineer. My mom's a social worker. She, they couldn't hire me. You know, your dad could hire you. That's a big difference in the community that right. you grew up in with your parents owning a business and, you didn't have to think about where you could work. Right. The community I'm focused on, their parents are working class. They don't own anything. Right. And they can't help them find that first job as easily. So that when I explained it to him, I think he got it for the first time. Right. Like, oh, that is a difference. So yes. like you didn't have to struggle to find a job. Your dad said, come work at the production company. It's that always, wasn't even a thought. Yeah. It's always like so interesting because I, I had a similar conversation. Uh, me and one of my good friends, we were in Iceland on vacation. And we drove essentially all around the damn island. We rented a car. We drove around the island. And we had a talk about just like the differences in, you know? And it was really, it took Literally, probably an hour of me repeating the same thing in a few different ways 
for her to understand fully like, hey, you know, like my people, me, my personal family have been here, you know, generations before you. Since her parents are Italian, her grandparents were Italian immigrants. So it's like, you know, you have three generations in this country. I have at least five or six. And, you know, the things that you can do, even as a woman still technically an oppressed class, like the things in, in you can do and go and say, I can't do. And it just, it took a lot of drilling, but she got it after a while. So it's just always interesting to me to bring it back. Like most people live in areas with groups similar to them. So, you know, it's yep. like one of those, it's, it. it's one of those things. <clears throat> so that leads me to my next question. Uh, it's our question. What's, uh, what's your ethnicity? Like where are your parents from? Uh, my dad is from Guyana. Okay. Uh, so I'm Guyanese. Guyanese. Guyanese yeah. yeah. So I'm half Guyanese, half American. Okay. Cause I'm like, booty is an interesting name and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I was like, it's I West could... Indian. It's okay, West Indian. Yeah, okay, it's Indian. Cool. Yeah, so he's for those who don't know and listen, Guyana is a small country right above Brazil. Uh, right now, it's being it's been in the news recently because of a deal they struck with Exxon. Lots of gas, uh, so lots of people are becoming or ladies become rich, which is which Guyana has been one of the poorest countries in the world for so long, and mm-hmm. now they have the potential to turn it around because of this oil that was found. All right. And so circling back. So what has been your experience as a black man in the startup VC space? Ooh. VC being venture capital. Sorry, I'm speaking yes, words. Venture capital, <laughs> yes, um, I know. Yeah, I would say I know. For those who yeah. don't know, venture capital. Uh, it's been interesting. I think I like to ride this line of up until starting a, a startup, I never used to look at color because I like to just see people as people. Mm-hmm. And I try to stay away from putting people in parameters of, you know, white, black issues, because I think the, the, the issues we have are human as a human race. But I think when you look at statistics with who receives funding, you can't lie. It, you know, the numbers don't lie with who's who's receiving funding. And there are many factors for that. Right. But when I jumped into the startup world, I have friends of all colors. And I think my what immediately became clear about me stepping in from a, you know, I was a, a senior executive uh, at a, a tech company. Then when I started my own and became CEO, uh, which means the number one person that you have to communicate with uh, so you do with the investors you do with your board of advisors you do with your board um i think people who don't look like me started treating me a little differently uh and there are many people who helped me get meetings but I, at that point i realized i was gonna have to work a thousand times harder to close these deals because these white men mostly who i was meeting with were shocked one that i got to them which was so <laughs> crazy back in 2014 2015 they were shocked that I got to them, and I've had. I have, I'm going to write a book about this one day, but I've had many private, off the record conversations of old men, uh, many who were former partners at Goldman Sachs and billionaires, uh, who off the record just said things to me where it's like, "I'm impressed, you know, you got to me uh, for this meeting," and you know, it's not often that I see someone like you. Just little things where you're like, oh, this is... Anything bold, again, anything bold, like, I'm so, th- th- was it hard to get out of the projects type of situation? You know, like, those type of lines or, like... No, any, no. But more subtle questions. kind of, like, I'm just surprised that you are... Even here. in New York, I had to, I took <laughs> investor meetings in New York City, again, one of the most diverse cities, and I'll never forget, <clears> I had someone... Who I, I know I will write about, but he was very frank, and I I told I told him in the meeting because his son was there. His son is my age, um, younger, and so he wanted his son in the meeting. And this guy was just lots of money, and he said to me, he said, he's, and he said it quite frankly. He said, "You're black," and I said, "Yeah," because yeah. again, my name, <laughs> you know, my full name is Jeff Booty, so it's not a, you know, I I could have been Indian, which right. again they're used to there you. So my last name isn't a Johnson or a, yeah, it isn't a name that you, unless you, you know, if you're just seeing Jeff Booty, Jeff is a safe right. name. First Not the name, classical, you know, <laughs> you know African no. American yes. or black name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or African exactly. American. So, yeah. Exactly. So 
sometimes, you know, with this meeting in particular, this guy just said it out loud. He's like, yeah, you're black. And I said, yeah. And I said to him, I said, thank you for saying that because I have walked in many meetings throughout these last few months taking pictures and you know that's what you're thinking. I know that's what you're thinking. And I hate to think that that's what you're thinking in 20, at the time, 2015, because why would you not, especially because this guy was a, a big guy in New York, you know, why would it be uh, challenging for you to see someone of color take a pitch? You're mm-hmm. an investor, you know, you're an angel. Like, why am I the first black person that in you, New York City that you've, talked to, to. That, you've, that you've come in contact with? It just, back, like, it literally was like, oh, this is real. This is, now that I'm on the front line of trying to raise capital, you know, the other times I've had my white colleagues, they took that role. But when I became CEO of my own company, I was the head and I had to take meetings. And I realized it was a different, um, I was treated differently. Uh, and I didn't want to believe it. Because I like to think, no, this, this this can't be right. You know, like I'm friends with everyone. I don't I have all color friends uh, and I love people no matter what your color is. So but when it became clear that I had to work because my friends were raising money faster than me and we have the same background. I've started I had been a part of several tech companies that mm-hmm. worked for someone super famous and had so many connections and a wealth of resources, which got me to these big meetings, but right. I couldn't close as easily. And that's when I knew something was up because my same friends with no experience who were white um, were able to close deals off of paper decks. Uh, again, this is all a game. It's like you, you go into meetings, you, you pitch your idea. It's, it's nothing. You can have no prototype, no product and raise half a million to a million dollars. Right off of just paper and your name. Right. So, and with no experience money. ever running a company, uh, these people have that much money. And, but again, for some reason I was just knocking and it was just a lot harder, but I eventually broke through. So, but it wasn't easy. So, hmm. and no, everyone said it wasn't easy. That I would, I would say that too, for those listening, like my friends of all colors said, Oh, it's not easy. Yes. Raising capital is not easy, easy. But when you are of color and you, you do, I've realized the knocks are a little harder. Right. Uh, it's layered. Like it's, it's layered. The it's bullshit layered. is definitely layered. It's not the yeah. same level or stress level. It's definitely layered. And there's, um, so this is, and it's not, like you said, it's not too many black people in the, the VC starter space, anything. So it's always interesting to hear like a similar story or like I read an yeah. article that I think, black enterprise about women who female business owners who to get money for their startups or their business ideas were doing like pitch contests Mm. and it's like you know you get a prize for the pitch or whatever and they were you know they were there's these community of women that are doing out of the box things to get the capital that they need and so yeah. it's just, like I say, it, it's always just interesting to talk to somebody that's actually in it and has a company, a concept, an idea that's actually, you know, thriving. So that's that's cool. No, one of my good friends, uh, I was giving her a shout out, Uncharted uh, Play, Jessica Matthews. She's in New York. Uh, she's one of the first females of color to raise over $20 million. Oh, wow. Uh, and she was on my Connect Up. She was one, I guess, on my uh, master class uh, in February, and she shared with the class like she's a Harvard grad, again Harvard grad, person of color, right? Yeah. And ha- her struggle as a female, right? Again, those are lens I can't relate to, yeah. right? I'm a male, so I have to be sensitive to my own view. But she said, even for her as a Harvard graduate, right. female some of the things she would be asked, like to be slept with, you know, like, oh, sleep with me, or things that, again, like you would, I would never experience because none of these guys are asking me to sleep with them. Right. Uh, but as a female, right. she would, these are questions in her circle of female friends and entrepreneurs. They they would be asked me, you know, to sleep with, and it's, right. it, it's still like, what? Like you almost are shocked. But then because of my own experience, I'm like, I believe it. Right. Like I have to believe it because if I say that can't be true, right. I'm denying the fact that I was my struggle as just being male and and not getting checks cut as easily. So um it so when you say black women who were uh having to be creative, I get it. Because if you didn't go to Harvard or Yale, 
um, you aren't going to be taken as seriously because these you men probably can't even relate really get to in you. The door. Like it's like why you know it's like there's no some there's yeah no, they can't relate yeah. to you as easily. Yeah. And that's what a buddy of mine who's who's uh, who I'm working on some projects with he even acknowledged that he hadn't invested in any minority women. He's a white male in his sixties. He had not invested in any women because they just weren't in his peripheral. Right. Um, and it just it reiterated her point of how much how challenging it is one for black women and then two uh the opportunities to be seen by someone like him are nearly impossible uh because he's not looking or his 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 lens as a male is not reaching out to the black you know to black women right um and it's all relatable you know people again trust people who look like them more uh, and hopefully the world continues to change as we become more diverse. But uh, those have been some of the roadblocks. Uh, it's changing because people have put spotlights on it mm-hmm. and made white men aware that mm-hmm. this can't keep happening. This can't keep happening. <laughs> <laughs> this can't keep happening. And, and I, now they're sensitive, but, you know, this I, is what it is. I always say to, um, like, the more I understand about humans in general, the more I kind of begin to look at racism or prejudice or bias in, in less of this light in more of a an empathetic light. In the sense of like, again, I don't look at it as necessarily, you know, black, white. I look at it as tribe one and tribe two. And so it's like, again, it's just proximity and level of empathy and understanding. So like, just there's, there's things that me and you are going to be able to talk about and understand versus, you know, me talking to someone who might be a male, but who's white, who doesn't look like me because the tribes are different, you know? And it's just Mm -hmm. like, it is less about, it's less about racism sometimes and more about tribalism, you know? And it's Mm -hmm. just kind of like one of those if you can kind of differentiate between the two, that it, it, it makes it, I don't know, how do, how do I say it? It makes it more easy to understand, like, okay, this person isn't necessarily a bad person. She just doesn't have, he or she doesn't just doesn't have the experience with this tribe, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's, it, it's, oh. it's kind of made me be able to completely look at things a little bit differently and be able to approach problems and situations a bit differently. So, but, um, that was deep. Moving on. Uh, <laughs> um, how did the, uh, how'd the podcast come about, brother? Ah, uh, yeah. Seven questions. So, again, for those who are out there, if you're entrepreneurs, you started something, I think when you are so focused on your goal and your vision and you put that out into um, existence, after a while, you you know, that's your life, you know, day, night, you breathe this company. And then finally, when I decided I wanted to let my hair, you know, put my hand above water for a second. I was going to say, like, you can't I, say let your hair down because you're bald. Yeah, I have no hair. <laughs> uh, I can't say let my hair down. Uh, I, have, I am bald. Uh, but, you know, when I decided to put my head up above water, I was like, I have gotten so lost into this company that there were other things I'm, I'm excited about and passionate about. And I've kind of let those things fall to the side just to put, because a company takes so much energy uh, to just put all my energy into making this company go that I realized there were other things I wanted to do in life. And so about two years ago, I just started seven questions and I made it so that no one on my team would think I was <laughs> doing anything full time. It was more just like, let me just, I have so many influential friends and people I admire and respect that I thought, let me just not put a a parameter around it. Let me just, you know, make it so that uh, it's not has to be every day, every week. It was like, as I feel like it kind of thing. Uh, And that helped greatly because I didn't have the pressure to be like, all right, every Monday I have to get, you know, a new person. It was like, you know what, as I feel called, I want to step out and start interviewing people. And interview people I find fascinating and that have influence in some way. Uh, that's how it started. Because these are friends I would never work with because I have a recruiting company that focuses on Gen Z and underrepresented people. And, you know, I have friends who are actors, who are singers, who are cardiologists and people yeah. who just do incredible things yes. that I'm fascinated by. But we wouldn't go into business together. And so 
I thought, you know, this podcast would be a way for me to connect with them and ask them questions that I wouldn't normally ask, you know, at a dinner table. So that's kind of how it started. Mm. And the podcast is seven questions, by the way, guys. Yeah, so, seven questions. Yeah, yeah man. You just, I ask people of influence and that I find interesting. They pick seven random questions from a box. Yeah. How'd you get that? How I always wanted to ask, like, where'd you get? How did you come up? Did you come up with the questions, or did you get them from somewhere? Or I came up with the questions by listening to people speak. Um, some just came to me from the top of my head. Others came from other interviewers that I would listen to. Of course, Oprah. Of course. Uh, Barbara Walters, people that would ask questions and I would like, oh, that's a good question. Let me write that down. Mm -hmm. And I just spent time writing questions that I would want to have in the box that either I heard in interviews that were different from like, you know, the what do you do? What are you up to now? To like deeper life thought, you know, type questions. Um, And then I just collected them and now I've got plenty. (laughs) Yeah, it's like I was like, because I'm listening. I always listen to the questions. I'm like, damn, that's a good question. Like, where's this question? Where <laughs> yeah, this no, it's. From? I think imitation. Uh, you know, I I prefer to, in some ways, re- not reinvent the wheel. It's like if there are questions that are great, it's, there's only so many words in the human language. So if they're great questions, I'll put a little twist on them that have been asked. But why why make up my right. own when there's <laughs> there's great right. ones out there. Right. Um, um, but this is a different, you know, different concept. So uh, you would never connect the dots back to any one interview. Hmm. And then uh, I think my next question. So I wanted to know, how did you get to be so connected? But then I realized as I was writing this question, what was it like working for Oprah? Because that'll probably answer the question that I just asked. <laughs> yeah, I spent three years working for her general manager, uh, Nancy Denhoff, who I appreciate and respect to this day, who gave me the opportunity of a lifetime uh, because I went to a small Christian school in Virginia uh, called Eastern Mennonite University. And you went to a Mennonite I studied school? biology. I went to, yeah, I grew up Mennonite. I was raised Mennonite. I know that's a whole other story. Wow. Uh, but yeah, so raised Christian and did not go to media school, entertainment school, publishing, you know, any of that background. I had a biology degree, psychology minor, um, and I was in New York looking for work. <laughs> uh, but I, I do owe several people thanks because I, at that point, at 21, I realized relationships were everything. And the people that I had interned for within the newspaper industry, it was finance, business, uh, really stuck their neck out on the line and sent a recommendation letter to Oprah's general manager at the time. And that got me the interview. And then, you know, it was up to me to, you know, the door was open and it's up to me to close, you know, to uh, secure the bag of the job. So I think I tell people now, like, you can have someone open a door for you, but you still have to go through it and close the deal. Uh, Just because you get the interview doesn't mean you get the job. (laughs) Was that a, was that the direct interview with Oprah or was that the interview with her GM? GM. GM. Okay. Okay. Yeah. GM. Yeah. 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 Um, And yeah, that would have been more nerve wracking. I think. Right. Uh, That would have been more nerve wracking. That's why I was oh like, wait, 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 wait. I need some, like, you kept it cool with Oprah? Like, we, we got to talk. Like, yeah, I need no, pointers. That would, be, that would definitely be more nerve-wracking. Um, yeah, that would be crazy. Uh, what was it like oh, working there? <laughs> oh, man, it was a dream. Uh, I think I had, you know, in three years there, my parents loved me because, especially my sisters, I had so much product, you know, every couple of months we received so much stuff so staff got to pick and i just have bags of stuff i had no use for like just all kind of stuff for your face and body and lotion and people just you know oprah at the time she had her show going and so people just sent us so much stuff and i had i didn't grow up that way so all of a sudden i just saw success at another level like mm-hmm. i was literally at the top one of the top media companies businesses brands like she was she was just everywhere and people wanted to get to her. And I, and I got to see firsthand 
the protection around that. You know, we all had contracts where we could disclose things. And I was just like, I work for, like, you don't realize, and your parents make you realize it. because They're out proud of you and talking to everybody about mm-hmm. it. But then for me, I was like, wow, I am in a whole nother world where mm-hmm. things just get thrown to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, where people just want to send you stuff, like, mm-hmm. and you don't have to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> kiss, I, had, I mean, there were ah. gift cards, and I had received spa things, and just Oprah herself was so generous. I mean, every year she'd give us, um, I mean, she was friends with Steve Jobs, so we get every Apple product would be on my desk, you know, the latest. I have got multiple iPads from her. Um, uh, just she was really, she is a giving person, mm-hmm. and so. You know, she's really who she appears from, to be on TV. You can't make it up. Yeah, okay. no, she is who she is. Uh, hard business woman, but she certainly was really giving at the same time. I mean, I talk about this elsewhere. She's, you know, she gave every year uh, one week's worth of pay from her own money, from her salary to staff uh, around Christmas. And you never knew if it was coming because she always said, you know, don't look forward to this every year, but every year we come around and that bonus would come <laughs> and those things in life, like no one else would no other magazine and media companies or especially as you know, I wasn't a VP. I was right out of college. So you think, you know, my title was I was business coordinator and I was receiving a bonus. Like that meant so much more to me because I'm like, I'm already low on in the Oprah world within her organization. And it's not just the big guys that she, that's, you know, her VPs that's that are getting making the bonus, yeah. the bonus which is normal in corporate. Right. You know, it's every, the assistant, the court, like everyone gets it. And that was that, how can you not appreciate and respect someone who looks out for everyone? Like right. not just the people at the top who even now still get the bonuses. You're like, wait, what about the little ones right. uh, who, 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 are, who are working just as hard uh, answering those calls and doing whatever it takes to get the company, mm. you know, to keep the company going. So, I respect her and will owe her forever for making me see as a young man how a company can be run um, where people feel good about being there every day, uh, which is not easy. You know, in many environments, people don't want to be at work. <laughs> so uh, she created a space where you wanted to be at work and you wanted to like be better and do better. And I am trying to replicate that. Mm-hmm. It's not easy. I know uh, the question about being connected is so interesting because uh, for me, having been in the L.A. ecosystem, Mm -hmm. like I kind of get how you could be like a startup guy and run a tech firm, but also be, you know, cool with Oprah, but also no Diddy, but also be cool with Steve Jobs because it's like the circles kind of overlap in a way that I've never really experienced in any other city outside of LA. Just like, Mm -hmm. it's very, uh, it's kind of like, uh, I kind of liken it to how in New York, everyone rides the train. It doesn't matter Mm -hmm. if you're the CEO of the business or the person that cleans the toilets, everyone gets on the A train. You know, LA is the A train. (laughs) Like LA is the A train. So it's like, it's just, it's just always true. And I think the last question I wanted to ask you about this was what made you after being in entertainment what made you leave entertainment to go the opposite direction i guess that's interesting you say that i left i never felt like i left entertainment Mm -hmm. because of my being and my relationships uh and that's why i think you know i launched masterclass connect up because it's it teaches you that just because you operate majority of your time in one space doesn't mean you you should lose those people because they they you because traditionally they don't add value to you right like right. people tend to push people like it's like oh you don't have value to me, you don't add value to me anymore and so therefore i'm not i'm gonna lose touch uh and people are often ask like booty how do you do it where you can maneuver into another space and still keep those relationships you know my mentor one of my mentors is Gail king Oprah's best friend. Mm-hmm. If I need to get on the phone with her, or if I email her, she gets back to me. And it's been 10 years. So I tell people I don't lose real, like people that I know who've impacted my life, no matter what industry, I want to keep you close because you've given me a chance or I've learned from you or we've learned from each other. And to lose that relationship because I'm currently 
excited about one thing doesn't mean I won't want to jump back in. Right. And I don't want to just now lose that relationship. And then when I'm ready to now start my own TV show, I'm like, remember me? You know, yeah, from way ago? back when. Yeah, 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 it's like, no, I don't remember you. Or why are you reaching out to me now that you need me? So I just keep people close and within arm's reach at all times because I don't know what might excite me next. Uh, and so when I started Job Snap, and let me just back up. So I left Oprah, moved to LA, ended up working at DreamWorks Animation and Production and Recruiting. And when I was at DreamWorks, DreamWorks is a, I mean, it's another magical place to work. But I got to see the future in 2010. Uh, and I saw that things were, even Hollywood was going tech. You know, I didn't see at that point Netflix, which is now a tech company, right? Right. But, it, but they do productions, but they're an app and they're, they're not a traditional TV channel. Not. And so at DreamWorks, I saw the future because I was around some of the smartest tech guys creating animation. And I was like, oh, this is where it's going. And so in my mind, I wanted to create a video platform. Granted, it's in recruiting, but our video software, our goal is this year, um, we're, we're launching in with some, with, uh, potential, uh, media companies, uh, still in the same market of hiring, but we're now looking at productions and just getting back into entertainment, right? Like it took four years, but like my vision has always been JobSnap is a video software that tells the stories of young adults looking for work. Now, right now we focus on restaurant retails. My vision has always been entertainment and other media outlets that lack diversity still, uh, especially in production. So right. while on the forefront, you may think of like, you know, like this, it's the opposite of what people think of DreamWorks. People think, oh, DreamWorks animation is a studio, it's Hollywood. But when I got in, I saw, no, this is a tech company. Mm -hmm. And people didn't understand it. I would explain it. They're like, what are you talking about? They make kids movies. I'm like, no, they do this through technology and it's all on the back end. It's cre like, it's mm -hmm. insane. And if you don't have that experience to see like, oh yeah, this is marketed out to Hollywood. You've got Rihanna and all these amazing celebrities that are the voices behind these characters, but the people doing the work are all tech geeks building uh, systems that make these characters move. Um, and then when I got to see that, I was like, oh, this is where the money is. And this is where the creative, creative process really is. And this is where the future is going as technology continues to be more and more in our lives. Um, and that's what excited, that's why I left. Cause I was like, Oh, I want to, I want to be at the forefront of where we're going and not look back and say, wait, technology is going to keep growing. And it, to this day, it still is, you know, right. look, we're using FaceTime where now people are forced to use zoom and all these technologies that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, weren't as prevalent. Um, and it's continuously just going to keep growing. So, that's why I left, uh, or not left, sidestepped. Sidestepped. Uh, yeah, sidestepped. Uh, and then I started my podcast so that I can dip my toe back. Kind of go back into it. Ah. Do with people so that I have a media platform that people can, uh, and my friends who are in the industry can reconnect with mm -hmm. uh, without wanting anything other than to share their stories. So, you know, there are ways <laughs> that I've been able to just keep, again, uh people aware that I'm so interested in media without being at a Netflix company or right. a Paramount Studios um, or even an own. So. Good answer. I like that. I like, I like the way you brought that back. It's a long answer, but... I, they, I, they I like the way you brought that back. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> uh, fun questions now. So, what have you been doing during this lockdown to keep sane and, I don't know, keep fun? Like, I know you swim. But have I do you swim been able to swim? Been, I have not been able to swim. I'm in a complex that has a pool, but it's all shut down because of social distancing. So that sucks. The beaches uh, are closed too, right? The beaches are closed. Okay. They made no, like, I go to Equinox and oh, I miss that pool so much. All of them <laughs> are closed. Uh, it's tough. It's tough. So, yeah, so no swimming, but I, there's this Peloton app that I use. And they have multiple types of workouts, yoga, boot camp, strength, um, running. And so I, I downloaded it a month ago during the shutdown through friends who were like, you should try it. Now I'm hooked. Uh, and that's 
I do that in the morning. I meditate. And then, you know, my goal each day is I'm trying to read way more books than I've ever have. And since we have another month here in L.A. of shutdown, you know, right now it's May 15th, potentially opening up. I want to make sure I use the time and not look back and say, wow, I had, you know, two months of 2020, like literally two months, two months. Of 12 like months, two whole months, the whole year. Right. Uh, what did I do with 60 days plus to enhance my uh, life, enrich my life outside of being frustrated with not being able to be social and hang out with my friends? I think this, these two months are a time for me to enrich my knowledge of books I've been wanting to read. But again, I'm, I'm out six days a week, <laughs> socially working full time, you know, doing multiple things. So I, I, I could not make the time to read as many books as quickly. And now I have no reason not to read as many books throughout the whole, you know, and, you know, I'm trying to read a new book every two days. So uh, I'm excited about that. Just mm-hmm. reading a lot. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's reading a, a lot. That's a lot of reading. Wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. But there's a lot of great content of especially inspiration and business. Uh, right now I'm reading Ben Harowitz, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Uh, it's an incredible book. I've been wanting to read it for, I can't even say how long, for the last year. Um, and just now it's I'm halfway through. So it's just exciting to use this time to like mm-hmm. knock out books and now see, man, now I see why that person told me to read this book. Right. It's, it's just, I have the time, so mm-hmm. there's no excuses. Uh, I have the time. So yeah, last question. Uh, fun question still because we're on fun questions now. So during this during these lockdown times, um, Corona Bay? No, no Corona Bay, <laughs> no Corona Bay, no, 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 no. Corona single. No corona love during single. lockdown for you. Man. <laughs> <laughs> no love. Listen, uh, uh-uh. we were saying socially distance, uh, following the rules. Uh, definitely, obviously on Tinder swiping, but other than that, it's like. Well, I'll see you when I see you, you know, right. uh, it's, uh, there's nowhere for you to meet up. So you're kind of just swiping away, hopefully for a future where you can meet up. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, it, yeah, no, no, yeah. No, no, no Corona base. Yeah. No Corona Bay. Hey, me either. Just FaceTime base. <laughs> <laughs> me either, man. Me either. So yeah, everybody's in this. We're all in this together, man. Yeah. We're all in this together. And <laughs> listen, I, again, I'll let the first batch come out. Side first. I like the uh, first batch. Test Jesus. the air. <laughs> Make sure hospitals can hold them uh, capacity, and then you know, after a few weeks, then I'll venture back out again. I quit you. Um, um and I, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mr. Mr. Booty, uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you com- so much. Thank you. It was. It was a good convo, man. Thank you for so. Uh, thank you for coming on the show talking and uh spreading oh one more quick random question um give me a random fun gail and or oprah story go oh that's interesting mm-hmm. um I told you i'm good random at random fun <laughs> i mean it's funny my friend who is now uh the creative uh i don't want to mess up a full title but she's head of the online market of oprah.com now and she created a show now on through oprah.com where oprah and gail answer questions but years ago we always knew at staff that oprah and gail are just hilarious together and they should actually have their own show mm-hmm. like just because oprah's seen as such a serious mom like person and gail is the best friend who's just out and about and she's super social gail's everywhere and she Gail is so social, but she doesn't. And I'm always fascinated by this because I go back and forth. She doesn't drink. Uh, she's not someone who drinks alcohol. Oprah does. And, you know, hey, Oprah Auntie drinks. So, OB you know, lit. Okay, Auntie continue. Oprah loves you know, tequila. <laughs> uh, but it's all, you know, it's now public knowledge that she, she enjoys drinks. But uh, back then it wasn't. So you had to keep this to yourself. And so you being in an office and you see them in their act it was always fascinating because i'm like wow gail doesn't drink oprah drinks they're best friends this is possible you know i can have friends <laughs> this is possible <laughs> said this i is possible. can have friends that don't drink right uh and hang out with you know and not make me feel bad for drinking uh because i enjoy my you know tequila once in a while and wine um and the funny stories are just they their interaction off 
camera were just hilarious because Gail has no filter and neither does Oprah when they're together. It's they can just put each other in place, you know. Uh, where when you're looking at your bosses, you're like, oh yeah, this is the boss, and there's this things you're not gonna say to Oprah that Gail could could say, and just seeing them candid uh, and candid motion, you, there's just so many one-liners that now they have a show on Oprah.com that I think it's like two or three minutes each segment where they just get questions from viewers. Uh, and it's just hilarious to watch because it's just them being themselves as best friends. Uh, and you can't make it up TV. You know, you can't make it up. You got to watch it. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Did you did you have a chance to talk to Gail after the whole Snoop controversy? I did. Uh, well, I wouldn't say talk on the phone. Uh, I emailed her son, Will, uh, and her and just let them know that I was thinking of them and, you know, their, their response was nice and just appreciate it. Cause not many people at that point were, were being kind. So right. she's someone who's always made time for me whenever I'm in New York. And so I just want to let the family know that I was just reaching out to, to say there are good things. Uh, and I, I was on their side with this being taken out of context. So yeah, out of context. We're I out of context. That. I would agree with that as well. So well, cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have to eat. <laughs> All right, and guys, we are gone. Later. And ladies and gents, that's it. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed the convo. If you want to be a guest on the show or you know somebody that might be a good guest for the show, go ahead and send an email over to me. That's jc at theovt.com. Once again, that is jc at theovt.com. This podcast is available on Apple, Spotify, and Anchor, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a comment. And all of our content is now available on YouTube. We got video interviews, we got audio interviews, and original content all on the channel. Just type in the OVT Network and hit subscribe. Stay sane, stay safe, stay creative. Peace. I'm not no, as long as it's not, as long as I'm not seen, because I'm <laughs> definitely prepared for a visual. No, um, bro. right now I'm like <laughs> just. I thought it was just phone recording, so when you're like visual, I was like, "Oh, yeah, definitely." Not oh, you want you want to you want to see me? Oh, wow! I was like, we didn't agree to that. I didn't. <laughs> like, oh, you didn't okay. say that. Like you said, podcast, podcast, and sound, damn it.